And, um, you know, she, um, meeting her on Friday and then spending the time with her and her husband, Tyler, this weekend, for me is just an example of how I know that um, God is working in my life every day um, and arranges things, but blessings that I think he puts in my path that are this small turn out to be bigger than this room. And um, that is what Rebecca is. Um, she really and truly um, has so much experience, strength, and hope um, to share. I know that's what you're going to get this morning. And um, I love how she is always learning, always growing, and always seeking. Um, seeking more in this program and what God has for her. And um, so I am just filled with joy to introduce Rebecca Gale. <laughs> Good morning. morning. I'm Rebecca Gill and I am an alcoholic. It's really good to be here and uh, it is an honor and it is a privilege to say the least. I like to say a couple things too. Um, my husband and I have had the privilege to be here all weekend and um, you know I've been trying to pay, pay very close attention and I came to the conclusion that we have um, the council we have the staff, we have the, the volunteers, um, and the board. And all those parties had to come together in order to make this event happen um, so that we can come together and that we can learn and we can grow and that we can continue um, to hear, you know, messages of hope and network and bond. And, um, you know, just like me and Natalie, I was able to, again, add another, add another healthy woman to my network. Um, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. And that's a gift from this program. And I say that because when I got back to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't have any friends. So there is that. Um, but it's really good to be here. And um, so thank you for everyone who, who pulled this off, who came together, who had to practice principles, I'm sure, along the way. Let's give, uh, let's give everyone another round of applause. So uh, I will start from the beginning. We'll just clear up a few things. Um, so. My family calls me Rebecca Gale. My husband ended up telling my host that. My mother named me after her youngest sister, Rebecca, and her oldest sister, Gail. So my entire family refers to me as that or short for RG. So if I say Rebecca Gale anytime during my talk, you will know why. Um, and, uh, you know, I came from a very good home. Uh, I couldn't even start to blame or justify my alcoholism because of an upbringing. I had a safe home. I had loving parents. I have an older brother. He is my rock. Uh, he is a big part of my story. He's six and a half years older than me. My dad was a pastor until I was in about the eighth grade. My mother was a homemaker. My dad would work um, part-time driving a truck too because if you were if you are a pastor, then the church will provide you with the home, and my dad wanted my mother to have a home, um, to call our home. And uh, my mother was the homemaker, and she was sweet, and she would bake you cookies, and you know, thanks to this program, I have a wonderful relationship with her, but that wasn't the case before I made it back to these rooms in one whole piece. And if I can be half the wife and half the mother one day that she has been to me and the example uh, I'll be doing a pretty good job. Um, so like I said my background was good there was no sexual abuse there was no physical abuse there was no emotional abuse the reality is when I put alcohol in my body for the first time I liked the way that it made me feel period. There is something that uh, you know, in early sobriety, I read a lot in the big book. And uh, they said 
that, um, you know, I couldn't sleep. And they said, well, continue to read the big book and it'll put you to sleep. So I continued to read the big book. And along the way, you know, I really love the stories. And uh, so I want to share a little piece with y'all. And this is uh, in the story, My Chance to Live, and it starts on page 315. If everyone who needed AA showed up, we would be bursting at the seams. Unfortunately, most never make it to the door. I believe I was one of the lucky ones. Not just because I found this program at such a young age, I feel fortunate that I found AA at all. My approach to drinking brought me to the jumping off place described in the big book much faster than I could have imagined. If I'm convinced if I continued on my course, I wouldn't have survived much longer. I don't believe I was smarter than anyone else, as I'm often told by those who came in at a later age. It was my time, my chance to live, and I took it. If there still had been joy in my drinking or even a remote chance of joy returning, I wouldn't have stopped drinking when I did. I did not plan to get sober at a young age of 23 years old, but the God of my understanding had bigger and better plans. And uh, so I could really I, I relate to that so much, and I just wanted to share it with you. I was, I'll start from the beginning, I was born in Bamberg, South Carolina. Um, and uh, in a very small town, it has like one flashing light, lived there a few months as a, as a newborn. And my family, uh, we moved to Augusta, Georgia, where uh, all my mom and dad's side of the family is there. We lived there till I was three years old. We packed up, we moved to Mississippi, where my dad went to seminary school. And then we returned back when um, about nine years old or so. And when we came back, um, you know, my parents bought their first home. I came from a, um, you know, hardworking family. We, I did not get everything that I wanted, but I had everything that I needed and some of those wants. And uh, I was, I'll, put, I'll share a story with you. So when I was in fifth grade, I would go through the elementary school line and you could go to the lunch lady at the end and you could give her 50 cent. And if you gave her 50 cent, you would walk to the side and you would grab an ice cream bar. So I would give her 50 cent and I would grab two. And uh, <laughs> the isms were there long before I picked up the alcohol. So eventually I got caught and my mother had to come pick me up from school. I will say that my dad was very strict. By the age of 15 years old, you were not allowed to wear blue jeans, you wore a knee-length skirt, and you were a lady. And that's just the way that it was. So when I got caught stealing at school, I knew it wasn't going to be good. And uh, so my mother came to pick me up. Dad got home. He sat me in the chair, looked across from me, and he said, at first I thought the punishment was light. He said, what you're going to do is you're going to work for the next two weeks in this house, and you're going to do extra chores, and you're going to earn some money. And I thought, that's great. Uh, yeah, I didn't get a whip in. I could make extra money. I could just do some extra chores. I was like, this is a breeze. So about two weeks later, I'm sitting in the elementary school, and it is the big cafeteria because all the kids come together. And our table is about to get up to go through the line, and my dad walks through the door. <laughs> And I remember being like so like just oh like embarrassed, you know, like what is going on, right? And he said, Rebecca Gale, we're gonna walk through this line. And he said, You're gonna give this lunch lady back double what you took from her. And I remember walking through that line and I had to tell the lunch lady what I had done. I had to apologize and I had to pay her back double. Uh, those were the types of lessons that I grew up with. And although they seem tough, I am grateful for them because tough love is what I needed to get to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, for me, I, as, as a child, I, uh, I, didn't feel, um, I didn't feel different. Uh, I was very shy, though. I remember always being shy going year to year in school. And when I, when I got to the ninth grade. Um, I was the smallest person at my school. 
I, I was a very late bloomer. All the other girls were prettier than me, and some of those feelings kind of came into play. I took my uh, first drink when I was um, right at 15 years old. And uh, a friend of mine lived across the street from the high school. And that was um, in my 10th grade year. And uh, she lived right across the street. And so I had a bright idea, since her parents weren't home, that we will go across the street and we will raid her parents' mini bar. And this is embarrassing. We knew nothing about drinking, but of course we were listening to rap songs and stuff, stuff I wasn't supposed to do. And uh, so we went across the street, and her parents were out of town. We break into the mini bar, and we grab the Bacardi 151. Uh, because we had no idea what we were doing. We just heard, you know, in rap songs, this thing about Bacardi. So we're like, all right, cool, you know, this is what we'll do. So we lined up the shot glasses, and we poured them. And, um, you know, we all began to drink. And they stopped drinking, and I kept drinking. And uh, from the first time, that I first time that I drank alcohol to the last time that I drank alcohol, I was a blackout drinker. I saw no point in drinking if I didn't drink to get drunk. Uh, so there's an early sign there. And I remember, uh, I vaguely remember at one point that afternoon, it was closer to the evening, and I can remember coming up my mother's doorstep and seeing her to my right and just going straight in. And a few hours later, I get a knock on my door from my dad. And he says, it's, you know, we're going to eat some dinner, and you're going to have to get up and eat. And looking back, I think that he knew. He never said, you have to finish everything on your plate. But that particular day, he made me finish every single thing on my plate. And later, of course, it all came up. And uh, so this was my first drink. Uh, I didn't like the fact that it made me sick, but I really liked the fact I love how it made me feel. All of a sudden, uh, you know, insecurities and things like that weren't there. So the summer before my junior year uh, is when I was introduced to other um, outside issues, as we call them, as well as drinking and the keg stands and the parties. And, you know, life was, you know, it was fun. And... Um, we would go, you know, all over. Uh, we would be in one county to the other county. Parents thought I was at the movies, staying the night with a friend, and here I am in Statesboro partying, you know, um, and that's just kind of how it went. Um, but during that summer before I made it back, uh, you know, to my junior year of high school, an event occurred in my life as a young woman that kind of changed the course of my life. And uh, I can remember coming back into the rooms, or coming back into the high school, and I remember walking through the big, long main hallway, and everything at that point just seemed overwhelming. The insecurities was much more. The pain was there. The feeling different was there. Resentments were there. And I brought myself back and said, I know what will fix it. And... Um, I went from being an A-B honor roll student to failing six out of my seven classes my first junior year, or my first uh, junior year, the first semester. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I faked, like, I think they had like two report cards during that time, and I faked the first one, and I had that friend, and I never went to school. Um, I would show up in the morning, and then I would leave, and then um, I would come back home. You know, my dad brought my brother and I, I our first car. I had to have a job before. My first job was Dairy Queen, uh, which is great with some of the, you know, the earlier outside issues. Um, so I loved ice cream. And um, so, so my first job was Dairy Queen. I had to have a job. Um, I had to pay for my own insurance, and I had to pay my cell phone bill. So my dad bought the car, put the first full tank of gas in it, and said, this is it. So I had great, you know, learning you know, learning how to hopefully become an adult one day, right? And I'm grateful for that today. Not then, because, you know, all my other friends, their parents paid for everything. But nonetheless, um, you know, I, um, so I had my first job, and um, long story short, I came in one afternoon, and I sat down, and I said, I'm failing six out of my seven classes. 
and uh, I think I want to drop out. And my parents just kind of, you know, they sat on it for a while because they just, they couldn't believe that that was where I was at. And they obviously didn't know why. And obviously I wasn't talking about it. And so my uh, parents agreed. They said, all right, we'll sign for you, but you have to go. You have to get your GED and you have to enter into Augusta Technical College. You have to do something, get a trade, you know, medical, something. And so, of course, I said, all right, we'll do. And that's exactly what I did. And, of course, I went um, to the technical college, and I met more people, and I began to party more hard. And, um, and uh, you know, once again, it was a little bit of a blast. Uh, but what happened was, um, is, uh, you know, while I was uh, there, um, and I was living at home. My mom, be, you know, became a good snoop and all those things. And so at the age of um, 17, my dad knocked on my door early morning and he says, pack your bags and leave home. I cannot condone your lifestyle and what you are doing. They're finding the booze. They're finding some outside issues. You know, by this point, you know, my mom, you know, thought I was doing other things and I was so at one point I showed up and she has the police searching my room like you know they needed another program or at least I know my mom did you know but um <laughs> but uh you know the first time that my mom discovered a little outside issue in my pocket and you know the bottles in the car she asked she asked went to my brother and said you know what is this and um and, you know, it was marijuana, you know, and she was like, oh, my gosh. You know, she tried to immediately send me off to treatment. I'm like, Mom, no one goes, no one goes to treatment over that. You know, um, I thought it was comical, and, you know, I went on. But long story short, my dad had enough. He said, you know, he quietly and nicely told me to pack my things and leave. And then if I ever needed any help, to let him know. And so I pack my bags. I leave. I go stay at a friend's house. And, um... And I began, and I continued to drink, and I continued to party. And uh, while I was there in less than three months, um, previous to this, um, I was arrested. That was part of the thing. I was arrested <laughs> for shoplifting at the age of 17. You see, it was really wasn't about getting the item. It was to see if I could get away with it. So yet again, I have some more isms there, right? It's the truth. And um, I got away with it for a while, and then I didn't. Um, and with that incident, um, I waited till midnight. I was booked in at like 8 o'clock. My friend gets out in less than three hours. The jailer's like, hey, it's midnight. you got to call your parents. Because the way that it works is the law had just changed. They lock me up with like regular adults. But the only person that can bond me out is my parents because I'm underage. And so, of course, I call my family. They said, ask the jailer if you can call back in 20 minutes. The jailer made me call around midnight. I said, you don't understand. I'm better off here. If I call home, it's not going to be good. And uh, so I finally call home. My mom asked the jailer, hey, can you call back in 20 minutes? So I said, hey, you know, can I call back in 20 minutes? He's totally getting a kick out of it, you know. Um, and I'm like, yes, yes, he said I could. So I called back and she says, well, we have thought about it. And although we have had a short time to pray about it, you did the crime, you're going to have to do the time. And I ended up getting out like less than a week later because it was the weekend and, you know, all that kind of other stuff. And I'll say this, after that event, I never stole from a store again. However, I would steal from you and I would steal out your cabinets and out your medicine cabinets and all that good stuff. Um, but I didn't steal from a store again. <laughs> so, anyways... That had also occurred, and when I moved in with this friend's grandparents, you know, within three months, um, I'm pulled over um, at 3.30 in the morning on a Thursday with McCormick's vodka in the floorboard and beer cans in the back, and I'm driving someone else's car, and it's a five-seater, but we have six people in it, and, um, and I'm clearly under the influence, and uh, the cop pulls us over, and he says, you know, has anyone been drinking? And everyone raises their hand in the car but me. Um, you know, because I'm driving, right? 
And, uh, but I do remember it. And he said, uh, ma'am, I'm going to need you to step out the vehicle. And we had went swimming prior to that. So I literally step out the vehicle in black sparkly stilettos and a t-shirt down to my knees. And he's like, again, have you been drinking? Um, so a few of those people were arrested for drinking and disorderlies. And I begged this cop, I'm like, please do not. Like, I'm already on probation, please, whatever, whatever. So he ended up letting me, another girl, and one other person go home that night. And so I call, I, I call that grandmother I'm staying with because I can't get in touch with anyone else. And she comes to pick me up and she says, pack your bags and get out. And this becomes a cycle in my life. Um, so at this point, I have nowhere to go. I call my parents, and my dad says, sure, you can come home. <laughs> There'll be stipulations. I was six months from turning 18 years old. He said, you'll go to church, you'll go to work, and that's it. That's, that's what you do. So I did that. I went to work a lot, by the way. <laughs> and um, I was still at DQ, good old Dairy Queen. And uh, I stacked my money for two months, and I was going to skip town. And that friend that I had drank with for the first time, she had moved up to Virginia Beach, that's a great place, with her dad. And uh, so I jumped on a bus, and, um, and I skipped town, and I left. I was there for maybe a week or two, and my brother ends up reaching out to me, and we talk, and he says, all right. He says, you can come live with me. This is where my brother really comes into play. By the age of 23, my brother was visiting me in, a, in jail on his one-year wedding anniversary. Well, he was older, but by 23, he was a homeowner and working for himself in the electrical business. By 23, I was trying to get sober again. So we lived a very different life. Um, we were definitely opposites. But he said, you know, you can, you can stay with me. He required me to pay $50 a week for rent and to have a job. I can count on one hand in the next several years of my life, how much I, one hand, how many times I paid him rent. Um, what happened was, and I'll speed it up, from the age of 15 when I got the first job to the age of 20 in that treatment center that I'll tell you about, <laughs> um, I had 14 jobs. Dairy Queen was a year and a half. They upset me, so I went to Dippin' Dots, and I was the opener Monday through Friday. Um, so I'll show you. And I uh, went to Dippin' Dots, and, you know, the owner was cool, but he was like, Rebecca, you know, you can't come here under the influence. You, you have to do better. And um, so I'm like, all right, I got you, I got you. And so one particular day he came in, he says, look, we have special inspectors coming tomorrow. Will you show up? I need you to be alert and aware. I said, I got you. Well, I forgot about it that morning, and so I show up, and um, he, uh, he was very upset, and he basically made me go clean so no one could talk to me, um, and, um, and let me go. And I was there for nine months, but after that, it was 12 more jobs. You see, I could get a job, but I couldn't keep a job. I'll say this, and I should have said it from the beginning. There are a few outside issues. However, alcohol and alcohol strictly alone led me back to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I could not replace one for the other period. Um, so when I, um, so after all this had occurred, so by the age of 20, I had been living with my brother. I'm not paying rent. I'm gone for days or a week at a time. Uh, I had already buried um, two friends to an overdose, a couple drinking and driving accidents, didn't you know, think too much about it, also didn't take the time to grieve, I just continued to drink over it. And by the age of 20, I was 86 pounds. Uh, I was too ashamed to go home, so I would go home to my brothers maybe every week and I was a couch bum, and I bounced from couch to couch. And I was always where the party was. Uh, but it became 
not so much a party. I also remember those last six months I was sitting in a garage because that's the kind of places I hung out. I was sitting in a garage and I was talking to a lady and she was in her mid-30s or late 30s. She was 36 or 37. And I was sitting there and she's across from me and I'm across from her. And I guess it was a God thing and I said... Her liver was failing, her kidney was failing, she was living out of her parents' garage, and I was there with her, and I thought, man, I don't want to be like this, right? And I knew that I had a problem, and that void, especially some of the other speakers that have talked about, that void um, that I could never fill with anything, or those insecurities, or, or any of the above, I couldn't fix it. And so I remember picking up the phone and calling my mother. My mother would reach out to me every few days to make sure I was okay. They had changed the locks. I had not been allowed home since. And I said, Mom, I think I need help. And uh, so what I mean by help was, initially, was to see a therapist. Because I was still in that mentality of seeking other things, right? I'm like, maybe they'll help me, right? So I see this therapist. She says, okay, we can let you see a therapist. We'll pay for that. And I saw this lady just a few times, and she says, Rebecca, you really need treatment. And I said, what is treatment? And she says, like, rehab? I'm like, I don't need, you know, I'm, that's ridiculous. <laughs> She's like, no, you really do. <laughs> and uh, so I remember leaving her office. You know, I didn't tell any of my parents or anyone. And my cousin, who I'm very, very close to, my first cousin had just got out of treatment. And she had about six months under her belt. And um, so I remember calling her and, and talking to her. And, um, and I knew I needed to go. And by the time I told my brother and my mom, I thought that I would go to what you see on TV. Uh, like a, maybe a 30 to a 90 day program, get a little massage, you know, do yoga. And uh, the next thing I know, I am being shipped off to the Bridges of Hope. At that time, the Bridges of Hope was in Morvan, Georgia. Um, it's about five hours from where my family lives. And it is, um, I was talking to my host, and she was like, I can't believe you went there. I'm like, I did. It was kind of like a, um, it was a work camp, but it was a boot camp, but it was like super 12-step um, Alcoholics Anonymous base. When you got there, you sat on the first bench, first row of the first bench, and when you left, you would bless out in the back. Every day, you would go to work. You would work in the garden. You would work in the pine, pine straw crew. Uh, you would have to mow grass. Um, so they'll keep you in housekeeping for a while till you're getting a little physically better so I did that and I can remember like day two I was so weak that I went to go pick up the mop and the mop caught in the fan and it's just like everything spilled you know it was a mess um, I couldn't put two and two together by the time that I got there and uh, but what I do know is um, the bridges of hope planted a seed for recovery and for the time that I was there I know that um I was put there for a reason. I was taught so much there. And I wasn't done yet. But I also remember while I was there that I didn't, I, um, I remember the director, she came to me. Now let me say now, the first month or two, I bucked. I was like, I'm not getting up at 6.30 in the morning. I'm not mowing grass with uh, no self-propel. I'm not picking in through pine straw. Like, I don't do that. And they're like, oh, yes, you do do that you know and so like I would be late for count and they throw me out sticking well I like to go sticking because then I could write letters to home and tell my religious family that this was a cult and that they needed to bring me back I got a letter from my mother she says whatever it is it's the best thing for you and um, so they realized that I would like to just smoke c smoke cigarettes because you're not supposed to smoke during work hours and write letters to them. So sticking didn't work. So they would put me like near burn pit and I'd have to shovel out things and like wheel them all the way back to the property. And um, within a month or so, um, I realized that I just needed to do what they say so maybe my stay would be a little bit more pleasant. And I did what they said. And they taught me how to show up on time. 
and they taught me, taught me how to work hard. And they explained that gratitude is an action word. If I'm grateful for something, I show it. The director looked at me one day and she said, Rebecca, I want you to go into your room. I want you to open the closet door. I want you to look in the mirror. And I want you to tell yourself you're not special, precious, or unique. And I thought, huh. <laughs> and years later, I got what that meant. I'm just another alcoholic. I qualify. I can't do anything different. And um, so long story short, eventually I left the Bridges of Hope. Um, I, um, but I had reservations, you know. I can drink. Now, anytime I drank before, you know, I drank to oblivion. But I can drink, and I won't do any of these outside things. My uh, brother said, hey, you know, I know this lady at this hotel. She can get you, um, she might be able to get you into this, you know, a job there. And... Um, I thought, that's great. And, oh, and I left the Bridges of Hope as a head prep. So um, that was great. Um, and uh, so I get out. My brother tells me about this lady and says, you need to go to the Hilton. I get to a point because this woman ends up being um, a big part of my story, right? So I go there, and she sits down, and she does an interview, and she's looking at me, and she said, uh, did you bring your criminal? And I said, yes, ma'am. And I slide it to her, and she goes, oh, your brother didn't tell me about this. I don't hire thieves at my hotel. And I'm like, I understand. Um, I will do whatever you want me to do. I, I was going to meetings when I got out initially, and I got a job. And she said, you know what, you can wash dishes. And I was like, I was the head prep at the Bridges. She was like, oh, that's great. You know, like years later, we laughed about it. She said, it was by far the worst interview ever. Um, so anyway, I, uh, so I start washing dishes at this hotel. And eventually, I stop going to meetings. I get this, my boy, a boyfriend, because they told me not to do that. So I go ahead and do that. Um, I kind of got a sponsor, but I never called her. And in less than three months, I remember getting off a shift at the hotel, and I remember sitting at the Mexican restaurant, and I ordered a nacho cheese chicken burrito, and I ordered a Coca-Cola, and I ate about half of it, and the waiter walks by, and I said, oh, that fruity little drink, margarita, I think I'll have one. There was no recovery. There was no thought process. It was just... I picked it up just like that because I got away from the program because I didn't take the suggestions because I wasn't willing because I had reservations because I wanted the benefits of sobriety but I didn't want to do any of the work so I pick up that drink and so um, what happened was for the next couple years I justified my drinking mind you because I went from a dishwasher to running a full banquet department at this hotel um, I made good money, I got my own place, I had my own vehicle. From the outside, everything looked good. Occasionally, I would show up at my parents' house for Sunday morning dinner. Um, I tried to keep up appearances the best that I could. But during that time period, I would, uh, the first time I was out, I left the room for about six months, and then I came back in. And I would come back in for many reasons that I'm sure all of you have experienced. I was trying to save a relationship, so I'll go pick up a white chip, right? Um, I needed my boss to get off my back. My boss would come in, and when she came in early, and you know, because I always got in before, so as long as she came in at 9, everything was good. My routine was come to, throw up, go to work, work my shift, get there early morning, throw up again before I started serving on the floor, tell myself at 9 o'clock I wasn't doing this again tonight because I was so sick. And at noon I was planning my next drink. And it was repeat, repeat. So at night I would set my alarm because see I was going to manage it. See this step one thing I had a problem with this unmanageability part for a long time. You see I knew I was powerless when I put that alcohol in my body but I didn't care. I didn't care. 
as long as I could manage and maintain. Because at the end of the day, I like to drink. I work just as hard as the guys setting up these rooms. I work long days. I deserved a beer after work. Well, if I would have got what I deserved, I probably wouldn't be standing in front of you today. And that is only because of a graceful and merciful God that I had no connection to when I drank, obviously. I was completely cut off from that. Um, And so, you know, I continued this process. I came in and I came out. I came in and I came out. And I was the person that picked up the white chips. And I picked up 12 or 13 white chips during this time. And the old timers would say, yes, you're eligible too. You're eligible too. Well, I was a smart alcoholic. I had put money in a savings account because when Richmond County pulled me over and gave me that DUI, I was going to pay them their money. I had moved 0.8 miles from my job. I was going to walk to work. I would get my license back in six months, and I would keep on moving. That is sick. Uh, I might qualify. You know, I'm already pre-planning because I know that I know. But I'm okay with that. Um, And so what happened was, I came in and out. Like I said, I wanted the benefits. And I wanted the white picket fence and the dog and all that. The husband. But what happened was, um, on November the 13th, um, I had put about 27 days together. I never put more than 34 days together in about a three-year span. And um, I'd put 27 days together, and I went back out for four days. Four days. And on November the 13th, um, me and a former boyfriend had connected, and he wanted me to meet him at a local bar. It was a Sunday. And so I remember on the way to the bar, I was thinking I could go to that 8.30 p.m. group. And there was something in me that said to go to that meeting that had never occurred before, but I didn't. So I meet up with this gentleman. He met me there on his motorcycle. I met him there in my vehicle. And uh, we went in the bar and we drank. And we went from beer to tequila very quickly. And my usual night that always occurs, occurs. And I got drunk. And... um, What happened was, when he left that bar, he got on his motorcycle and he went down um, uh, Skinner Mill Road in the direction of Boy Scout Road in Augusta. And um, he was doing about 90 miles an hour around uh, Skinner Mill Road. He crossed lanes. He hit, a vehicle, he hit a vehicle, his motorcycle flew against the retaining wall of I-20, his body went the opposite direction, was in the road, I came through, I ran over him, I drug him another 30 feet, and I continued to drive. The following morning when I came to, I remember walking outside and smoking a cigarette, and I noticed the bottom fog light on the right side of my driver's car was missing. And I remember approaching that vehicle and there was blood splatter all the way from the bottom to the back. And I vaguely remember getting back into my apartment that no longer mattered. (laughs) I remember there's a cafe sign in my kitchen and I remember sitting underneath that cafe sign and I physically ripped the hair out of my head in a fetal position and I cried and I don't know how long that I stood there but I ask myself, why? Why didn't I go to the meeting? Why didn't I do something different? What is going on? I try to put my pieces together. I call Big Brother because he'll fix it. And I can remember calling my brother and I, can, and I can't put together pieces and he says, Rebecca Gale, I think you need to call Bucky. Bucky is, um, is a family. Um, he is my cousin's, the one that, is, she is still sober today, by the way, that helped me get in the Bridges of Hope. Um, and uh, so I call her husband, and um, he is familiar. He used to work for, um, you know, be a police officer and all this stuff. And, and he walked me through that process. Sunday, the accident happened. Um, Monday, I put together my pieces. Tuesday, I made a written statement to the police. I went. I informed my employer. For four days, I was under an investigation. Um, and I was arrested for a felony hit and run uh, that Friday. 
cause of death could not be determined. And I remember when I was arrested, I was taken in. I remember there was a trash can to my right, and I can just remember vomiting. All I could do was vomit. I couldn't hold down food. I couldn't hold down water. I couldn't do anything. And, of course, the judge said no bond because there's a death involved. That gentleman left behind a mother, a father, and a three-year-old little girl. It was at that point that I knew that my drinking didn't just affect me, that it affected everyone around me. And that's the selfishness and the self-centeredness of this disease. And I can remember going in, uh, getting booked in, and there was no bond, and I got shipped from one place to the other. And uh, Saturday night, I'm sitting there, I'm sitting in a population, and the news comes on, and I'm on every news channel in Augusta. <sighs> The public humiliation for my family, my employer, and everything that came with that was almost unbearable. However, in about a week or so, I was released under the care of this family member's individual because they considered me a flight risk. And when I got out, I went to two places. I went to my employer. She said, this is Lisa. We're not going to kick you while you're down. You're going to train her to run your banquet department. You're going back to the dish pit. Mind you, I had previously had a job for six months at the Doubletree waiting tables when I didn't have banquet events on Friday nights and Sunday mornings because my drinking had increased because I needed to pay for it. And that's just the way that it was. But everything was good, right? So um, I'm training this other person to run my banquet department. I get demoted to the dish pit. Um, I went from making good money to $7.75 an hour, but the second place that I went was back to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous to the 8.30 p.m. group. And I was ready. And I was willing. And they said, you'll be amazed before you're halfway through. And I don't really know if I believed them, but here's the dealio. I had two options. I had two options. My first, my first plan, because I always got a plan, you know, my first plan was to go back to the rooms, work this program 110%, and pray to God that it worked for me too, and that maybe one day I could look myself in the mirror while putting on my mascara, and I didn't have to not look or look myself in the eye, and that maybe I wouldn't have to drink strawberry insure for months, and I wouldn't wear a ball cap and look at my feet when I came into the rooms because I was hoping that you didn't know who I was. They all knew who I was. So there's that. <laughs> so I came in, and um, I'll say this. My first eight years or so in this program, I did have a male sponsor, an old-timer. When I came into the rooms, I picked this man for two reasons. One, I knew he would keep my stuff confidential, and two, he could walk me through the 12 steps of recovery thorough. He wouldn't sugarcoat it, and he would tell me like it was, is, like it was and I wanted, I wanted everything that I could get. When I, he first started sponsoring me, he said, open the big book to the first page. I opened the big book to the first page where the writing is. He says, no, open the big book to the first page. It was the blank page. He said, Rebecca, that's what you, that, that's what you know about recovery. You know nothing. The only thing you know how to do is drink. That's the only thing you know how to do. You know, I don't know how to live. I don't know how to cope. I don't know any of these things. And uh, he began to take me through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was pen to paper. You know, I noticed around the fifth month, I went to a meeting, and I had just done a fist step, and an old-timer says, hey, where's that hat? I'm like, oh, yeah. You know, some of those fifth step promises. I was able to look at me again. I was able to be okay when it was not okay. The first year or so of sobriety was brutal. I did not pick up a 60-day chip and was like, woo, life's great. It was like, oh. And I remember picking up one, and an old-timer said, why do you look so down, girl? You just picked up that 60-day chip. I said, this is overdue. He says, when's the last time you picked up a 60-day chip? And I smiled and said, residential treatment. <laughs> Anyone can pick it up there, right? So uh, anyway, we'll kind of start moving forward. And um, you know, early sobriety was rough. It was rough. Especially, you know, as a young woman, people, it's, uh, it wasn't that I had low self-esteem when I came in, it was that I had no self-esteem when I came in. You see, God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. 
He says, oh, you can support yourself? He says, oh, you're, you're independent? Okay. Oh, you think you can drink successfully? You think you're going to manage your life? I don't think so. If I, didn't, if I don't humble myself before my God, he's going to do it for me. And he did in his own way. And out of that came a really cool life. I just couldn't see it then. Um, so he put me in a place of submission. You know, I was at a point where I had to ask someone for a ride to the meetings. I had to ask someone to take me to the grocery store to get toilet paper. You know, I was, you know, <laughs> I was there. And, um, you know, that taught me a lot too along the way though. And, um, you know, what happened was, um, I'll share this too. When I was about six months um, in, I picked up my six-day chip, and three days later I walked into a courtroom. And my lawyer said, it's 50-50. If it goes to a jury, you're done. If you got one mad mother. I said, okay. And so um, I remember walking in that courtroom, and this is what I remember so clearly. The judge said, will the victim's parents please step forward? Um, the DA began to read um, the harm, the injuries to his body. And um, I remember just crying. And then I remember there was a shoulder, there was a hand on my shoulder and my mother had stepped forward I'm sorry and um his parents wanted me to go away for a long time rightfully so that was their pain and the judge looks at me and looks at them and he says, if I put Rebecca in prison, it will do nothing. He says, I'm going to think about this. He sent me out, took two more cases, brought me back in, and he said, um, I'm going to sentence you. I had fines, I had intense felony probation, and I'm going to sentence you to 200 hours of public speaking to high schools on the dangers of drinking and driving. And he said, uh, do you have a problem with public speaking? I'm like, mm-mm, nope, no problem here. <laughs> I had never done that. Um, my first talk, y'all, I was, I could literally hear my voice rattle in the microphone, literally. And, um, you know, it worked out the way that it should. It took me four years and 11 months to complete that community service. And I never cheated an hour because I didn't want to cheat another individual. After those first few talks, it was then the light bulb went off. And everyone else could see it, but I couldn't see it. I said, this is why he sent me here. And it wasn't the judge, and it wasn't the attorney. It was God working through those people. And I don't know how many, almost every talk, man, I would always have a student come to me whatever the case was, drinking, whatever have you, and I'd walk them to a counselor or their favorite coach or whatever it was. There was one death, but I pray and I hope and I think that there were hopefully the talks that I did, if I reached out to just one student for one night that didn't make the decisions that I made, then maybe it could help save a life. And that's why I was there. We're also asked to speak, to give hope to the newcomer. And also, for those who have been in these rooms for a while and going through struggles, and you don't know why it's been put on your plate, and you need to hear something again. You need to hear a reminder. Um, so I did that. Um, life went along. You know, eventually that, you know, that, that job promotion came back. And, um, and eventually I worked my way up the ladder. And, um, you know, I began to sponsor women and, you know, just live the program. 
I was in two and three meetings a day for at least my first year of recovery. I was in a meeting every single day for the first five years of my recovery except a few when I had been invited on a cruise because I was four years in and um, uh, a family member of mine, her husband was a doctor, he couldn't go and like the other family was coming but they you know, knew I didn't have the funds to go because um, I had a lot of other stuff to take care of and um, they invited me and I was like, all right, cool. And uh, they have, um, they said they had friend of Bill W's, it was like on the itinerary, but every time I went there every night, <laughs> there wasn't no one sober there. <laughs> it was in the library. There was like two guys drinking scotch, neat, you know, playing chess. And I was like, well, this isn't it. But my cousin who was also in recovery was with me on that. And it was a really great time. And it was so inexpensive. Because um, I don't drink. You know, one, the ticket was free, and I paid $30 for a soda unlimited package. Package. It was fabulous. Everyone else blew their money. I didn't. Um, but it was pretty good. But I was antsy when I got off that ship, to say the least. Um, and uh, so that was a pretty cool thing that happened. But anyway, so I, um, so I continue on, and um, I'm going to share, you know, a little bit of, I'm going to, I'm going to share a little bit on the 12 steps first. When I was about five years into this program, I was at a convention in Augusta, Georgia, and I heard a phenomenal circuit speaker. And he talked about working the 12 steps backwards. And we've heard it in order. But here's how it goes. And I have done this. And I have to be honest, you know, I've done this in sobriety um, to a degree. And I'll get to that in just a moment. So 12, stop working without other alcoholics. Good, don't need meetings. 11, I stop prayer meditation. Eh, I'm good. 10, I continue to stop taking inventory. Why have I continued to stop taking inventory? Because I owe an amends. Why do I owe an amends? Because I've acted out on a defect of character now we're at six and seven. Why have I done that? Because I've probably caught a resentment. Now I'm at a resentment or a fear or harm. And I take my will back. I got this. You didn't do anything for me. I'll do it myself. And then I go back to step two. Now I'm in, you know, insanity. Then I get to one, and the next thing you know, it's like that. The disease will take me. I can work the 12 steps in order. I can practice the principles behind those 12 steps, or, or I can work them backwards all the way to a dream. The program gives me the gift of choice, and it gives me the ability to see it. My first sponsor said, one, two, and three is your foundation steps. Make sure they are strong. And make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, I have no reservations on if I can do anything and drink successfully again. I drank the joy out of it. Those first few months when I drank strawberry insure, I looked back and God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. I couldn't hold down whiskey if I wanted to. It's like, wow. You know? So then... Um, you know, I think about these things and, you know, good and bad has occurred in sobriety. It isn't like, oh, you get sober and life's grand. No, that's not how it goes at all. You know, I told my husband, uh, you know, a few months ago, I said, when I was about, you know, a year and a half in, these, in this program, I remember driving down the road and I just, I was driving, by the way, I was driving a vehicle. I had a license. <laughs> just want to throw that out there. Yeah. <laughs> Insurance was high. Anyways, um, so I'm driving, and I'm on the way to a noon meeting, and I begin to cry. I'm like, why am I crying? I couldn't figure it out. And by the time I parked at the noon meeting, I was like, oh. It's like joy, a sense of peace. I was okay with me. I was okay with me. I could look in the mirror. I knew that I was doing the next right thing. I knew that God was working in my life. And you know, those foundation steps and working the 12 steps and calling my sponsor when I'm struggling and sharing in a meeting where I'm at, like really where I'm at, is vital. So, 
Less than six months later, I get a call walking out of um, my, my home group meeting, and the officer called me, and he says, you know, is this Rebecca Gale? And I said, well, yeah. He says, you need to come home. You need to come to your parents' home. Um, long story short, uh, the officer informed me that my dad had taken his own life that night. And uh, I can remember my mother crying and my brother crying, and I just waited. Uh, and I can't describe the feeling, age 56, perfectly healthy, to see your parent zipped up in a body bag and put in a thing. And um, I had two options. I could, I could go back to drinking, because that's what I know, right? Or I could use the program. I could call my sponsor. I knew that no amount of liquor or alcohol that I could put in my body would kill that pain. It wouldn't kill it. It wouldn't kill it. But out of that, I started still doing those high school talks. See, I want to share the good that comes with that. The day before, something had told me to go see my parents, so I went out to visit them. I put on my floor-length skirt. I'm a lady. I enter my, my, my dad's house, as I should. I get to do that sober. I get to have a relationship. It was being restored. I was doing a living amends. And I'll never forget it. Before I walked out the door that Friday, I walked out, I shut it, I opened it again, and I said, hey, I love both of you very much. My dad says, I love you too. And the next day, he was gone. But I'll tell you this. I was about, it was about four months after his death, something came over me, it was all that bullying at school, and I started talking about self-harm, and how you never know what someone's going through. And after that, for the next several years of speaking, I always included self-harm and suicide in my talk, and I got more feedback from students on that than I did alcohol alone. My dad told me when I was under investigation that I needed to take my lemons and I needed to turn them into lemonade. And it's unfortunate he didn't. But I can do that today. I can do that today. And I have to remember that, you know, he'll carry me. He, he, he's, you know, every time, you know, I suit up and I show up. And God's always with me. And I have to depend on him and I have to trust him. And it's worked. Principle behind, you know, one is honesty. Then you have hope, two. Then you have faith, three. An old timer said that faith is a track record of hope. And that's always stuck to me. You know, like, I didn't come in here with faith. I came in here with like this tiny bit of hope that maybe I could look at myself and be a member of society one day and have a decent relationship with a few folks. That's it. I didn't realize those promises would really, really come true until I worked the program, depended on the steps and the principles and used them in my life. Um, and the group and a sponsor and took the time to answer the phone when I don't want to sometimes for the women that I sponsor or the people in my network, right? I have to do those things no matter what's going on. Um, you know, that's been unfortunate. I've buried a sponsee to this disease. I buried friends in my network to this disease. The gentleman last night talked about the black suit. I was told that men need a black suit, women need a black dress, and I also need a really pretty colorful dress. Because although I will attend funerals through this disease, I will attend weddings. I will be a part of childbirths. I will get to see all the miracles that sobriety gives to each of us if we can work the program and if we can keep coming back. I get to be a part of that. Um, and I just have to hold on when times are tough. You know, um, I'll share this too, um, and i got to wrap it up soon. I... Um, you know, that, that wasn't so great. Um, and yes, I've buried people. And yes, I've attended funerals. Um, and yes, God has given me challenges. Um, but he's also done some really awesome things in my life. Some really incredible things. And I'll share a few of those with you. Um, 
Uh, one of those is the relationship that I have, especially with my mother and my brother today. After my dad's death, I moved in with my mother for 13 months. I packed up my condo. I didn't think anything about it. I moved in with her. Today, we have a wonderful relationship. She is my best friend. They told me when I went to the amends process, I said, well, what do I do? Go knock on doors? They said, no, oh, don't do that. <laughs> they said, you'll know when the time is right. I sat down with my brother. I was a little under a year sober. He had called me and said, I'm doing electrical work at the mall. Do you want to come? You want to come to lunch with me? I'll, I'll pay for it. <laughs> I know, buddy. I'll pay for it. And, um, and then I'll take you home. I got paid that day. And uh, I said, yeah, I could probably get up there. Yeah, I get up there. So I got a friend from the program. They dropped me off at the mall. And we sit down and we eat lunch. And the feeling... Like, I knew it was the time. And I looked at my brother, Luke, and, um, and I was, you know, taught about the amends process and leave sorry about your vocabulary and these things. And I said, you know, Luke, I can't go back and undo. Um, and I went into a little bit of the emotional part of that between him and I. And then, uh, of course, I asked, you know, is there anything else, you know, that I can do? And he looked at me, and the ones that you think are going to go easier <laughs> end up going harder. Don't ex put expectations on this, by the way, if you're new. And um, he looked at me, and he never says bad words, really, but he said a few that day. And he says, you have no idea what it's like for your sister not to come home for days or a week at a time, Rebecca Gill. You have no idea what it's like to come into my house and make sure I got a pulse and make sure that you are okay. He says, you have no idea the pain that you've caused me and others. And I said, you're right. I don't. I said, there's one other thing, Luke. And I got that $100 bill. I slid it across the table. And I said, I stole from you. I stole directly out your wallet to do what I needed to do. And I said, and I didn't pay your rent, as we know. And he looked at me, and he took the money. I, he said, I'll take it. And he put it in his pocket, and he said, you know, Holly, his wife, we're going on a, you know, we're going to be going on a cruise soon, and I'd invite you, but you're not allowed to leave the state. So there's that. The money will come in helpful. <laughs> it's like, great. And, um, but from then on, we have restored our relationship. It's been really great. I have a niece. She will be 10 years old, January the 4th. She's never seen me under the influence of alcohol. I've never missed a birthday. That is some of the gifts of sobriety. I left that hotel about four years ago and decided to take a job at a treatment facility. And each day I get to go to work. And I get to help others. And every day is not perfect and it is a job. But I get to help others. If you would have asked me a little over 10 years ago when I walked back into the rooms, if I would be able to work at a treatment facility or have a wonderful husband or have the relationship with my family or the beautiful niece, I would tell you that you were crazy, but it happened. And life hasn't been perfect. I was married around three years of sobriety, and that ended in divorce, but I didn't have to take a drink or drug over it. I could go about it, I could share. You know, my husband is here with me. Today I'm married again. <laughs> Definitely an alcoholic. That's what I do. <laughs> and, um, you know, he's here with me. And, uh, you know, when we were married, you know, like, I was like, wow, like, this is great. Everything's perfect, you know. And, and he relapsed not long after. 
and all my knowledge and everything that I knew about recovery went out the window and I reacted as a fearful wife and I began to work the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous backwards. But I knew it and I did something about it because I knew that no alcohol would fix the pain of the broken trust and the things that comes with relapses. I went to a conference. This is where I met Perry. I went to the conference and my husband four days prior. I picked up a white chip and I go up in front of all these people and you know, I just did the best that I could. But while I was there, I heard an Al-Anon speaker. It was the first Al-Anon speaker I'd ever heard. And I was like, oh, God, I qualify. <laughs> <laughs> I left a Sunday on a Tuesday. I was sitting in the meeting. They're like, do we have any newcomers here? And I'm like, I'm a newcomer. <laughs> and halfway through the meeting, I'm crying. And then by the time I left the meeting, I was so upset. I'm like, I gotta do another program. <laughs> Is this real life right now? Oh my gosh. But then I realized after being in the room, those rooms for a while, man, I got double the solution in life. I'm winning. It's all about perspective. You know, today my husband is here with me. Today he is sober. And for that I'm grateful. Every day that each of us stays sober, no matter how long that you've been in here, is a miracle. If you're new and you don't have the hope or whatever, just keep coming back. It will come. I promise it will come. But there's things that I have to do. Uh, Old Timer says, um, the love my mother have, has for me is conditional, is unconditional. The love in the rooms is unconditional. But um, sobriety is conditional. There are conditions that I have to meet. I have to go to meetings. I have to go to call my sponsor. I have to continue to work with other other things. I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna close up while I'm over. I can't believe this has happened. Um, and uh, so uh, the last few things is uh, I got to have like this bucket list so this is really cool so like right before my 10 year um, I jumped out of a plane it was really awesome uh, and uh, I am adrenaline junkie and I've done it two more times um, you know this past October uh, you know my husband and I celebrated our, our second anniversary and we went to Hawaii and we jumped out of a plane there too <laughs> it was great um, you know I get to add I get to put things on my bucket list that I thought that would never happen it's really cool and, um, you know, I want to share this. The gentleman in that accident that left behind that three-year-old daughter, her mother is my best friend today. I'm invited to her birthdays. I get to be a part of if you are a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, you will be a part of miracles and you will get to witness miracles. And that is how my God works. And no matter the pain I'm in, if I can trust him in, he'll always be there for me. But I have to depend on him. And most importantly, don't pick up. I just try not to pick up and try to live the program. So I'm going to read this and wrap it up. It's on page 318. Life is not heat, monetary riches upon my head, nor have I achieved fame in the eyes of the world. My blessings cannot be measured in those terms. No amount of money or fame could equal what has been given to me. Today I can walk down the street anywhere without the fear of meeting someone I've harmed. Today my thoughts are not consumed with the craving for the next drink or for the regret for the damage I did on my last drunk. Today I reside among the living, no better, no worse than any of God's other children. Today I look in the mirror when putting on my makeup and I smile, rather than shy away from looking myself in the eye. Today I fit in my skin. I am at peace with myself and the world around me. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here.